On today's World Insight, a moment of silence marking the anniversary of the tragic death of black man George Floyd at the hands of police. How has it made a difference in racial reckoning in America? And a COVID vaccine lifeline amid the pandemic with China's pledge to deliver doses of the WHO-approved Sinopharm vaccine to COVAX and the world's most vulnerable. But why are vaccines so geopolitically charged? An international studies professor with answers. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. It's been a year since an unarmed black man, George Floyd, died at the hands of a Minneapolis police officer. His death has sparked anti-racism protests across the U.S. and other parts of the world. To mark its first anniversary, protesters of all races united in their call for justice, demanding action on racial inequality. As Floyd's death prompted a reckoning of deep-rooted racial issues, has there been any progress in real sense on police violence and racial inequality in the United States? Let's loop in our panelists. For more on one year after George Floyd's death in Charlotte, North Carolina, we are joined by Mary C. Curtis, columnist and roll call senior leader of the Op-Ed Project in Newark, New Jersey, Saha Aziz, professor of law at Rutgers University, in Washington, D.C., Brandon Andrews, entrepreneur and a former Hill staffer. Welcome to all of you. One year, much change have happened. Mary? Yes, it really awakened many people's eyes to really the problems of policing in communities of color. Mm. Now, a lot of folks who are in those communities could have told you uh, about the problems and the obstacles, but I think the world saw it. So yes, a lot has changed, but we also saw that some of these fatal encounters continue to happen, right. including while it was going on. So. There's a, a really ways to go as well. Mm. I think a lot has changed. First, I want to just know how tragic it is that it took the murder of a bla another black man for this change to happen. Uh, and the change, the most significant change that I see is this racial reckoning, this moment of racial reckoning and racial consciousness among young people in particular of all races. And that has created a sense of empathy, a sense of awareness and commitment to changing structures and systems in the US as opposed to being distracted with individual intent uh, as being the only means through which racism can occur. But I think that what these young people have realized and they are the future leaders of america mm -hmm. is that you can have people with the best of intentions functioning in the system that is structured to produce over representation of black people in prisons in poor quality schools in low-income jobs in uh, poverty statistics right. and so on and so forth and that these systems have to be fixed Mm. We've definitely seen some changes in the country over the last year, but certainly more needs to be done. If you look at it, and, and this is a this is a actually a pretty striking figure um, among white Americans, their opinion of Black Lives Matter uh, in terms of the number of white Americans that support the movement um, grew five percent over the past year, which is a really significant number mm -hmm. um, for this kind of opinion polling that's done. And if you look at white American support for Black Lives Matter, asking the question, do you support this movement? Right. Um, since 2017, it's up 10 percent. And so, the, but the question becomes, what do we do with this change in opinion? How do we actually take this change in opinion? How do we take what uh, has been in some ways an emotional reaction to uh, literally seeing someone murdered 
on screen uh, with the death of George Floyd right. and turn that into action that's going to actually make a difference for um, folks and communities of color. We understand that, that there is now a Georgia Floyd um, a Justice Policing Act that are now being discussed at the U.S. Congress. Now, do you see details of that act likely to change much to the systemic process and change that you earlier suggested? Well, for example, the part, the provisions that seek to remove qualified immunity, which has been, which is a judicial doctrine, it is not a legislative uh, doctrine, that effectively has allowed many police officers not to even be indicted or prosecuted, much less convicted, because the standard is so high for showing that that police officer has to have known that what he or she did was against uh, the con was a violation of constitutional right, and that a reasonable uh, police officer in those circumstances would also know that this was a violation and that it had been clearly established. So, in other words, it's a very high bar, and mm -hmm. if that is removed through this legislation, if this doctrine is removed, what will happen is more police officers will be subject to prosecution, and right. this will change their behavior. They mm -hmm. will be more careful. They will use lethal force only as a last resort, and they will err on the side of preserving life rather than shooting first and asking questions. So. In that regard, in that particular provision, I think there could be systemic changes. But ultimately, the problem is a cultural one mm -hmm. and a political one. And right. as an educator, I try to at least to show my students how laws that are facially neutral on the books can be enforced in a way that is racist based on stereotypes of those that are targeted, based on stereotypes held by those who have enforcement authority and legal power. And so much of it is a cultural shift that will take a generation. Hmm. Well, we saw today the Floyd family on the year anniversary visiting with uh, the president in hmm. the White House and George Floyd's brother, who's become quite an activist, saying, you know, we have laws that protect the bald eagle. We need laws to protect uh, African-Americans in their encounters with police. And there are other provisions there that would seem to be very common sense. Like, you know, if a, we have 18,000 separate police departments with their own rules, and if a police officer uh, get, does something egregious in one department and it's fired, they can go to another department. So just getting a database to follow up these bad police so mm -hmm. we will know about that, and also to limit some of the chokeholds, as the professor said, and no-knock warrants, and to get training, it could make a difference. Now. Uh, Senator Tim Scott, who's a Republican, Senator Cory Booker, a Democrat, and Representative Karen Bass, all African-American, say they are negotiating. They hope to have a bill today. They don't, but they are trying to negotiate to get one that could at least be the start of making a difference. Mm. Mr. Andrews, constitutional promises versus uh, reality of policing on the ground, there seems to be uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, kilometers apart. I think over the years we've seen a shift in this vision of what America should be, uh, and now it's time for the rubber to meet the road. And so that means legislation to make sure that um, what's laid out in the Constitution is actually what's happening and that the things that um, could potentially be left up to. Right. Uh, interpretation on um, some of the things that Professor Aziz um, uh, alluded to in terms of how laws are actually interpreted and, and how um, and how they're meted out um, at, at a local level, uh, making sure that those things are, are, are shored up. But I also think there is a role for the private sector here. Um, we saw in the wake of the death of George Floyd last year, or, uh, organizations throughout the, the Fortune 500 and, even, and, and far beyond it um, in terms of size of organizations, private companies making um, financial and, and other commitments to racial justice. And that bill is coming due. Some organizations have moved forward. Some organizations have, um, for example, um, given grants to, to local organizations. Some organizations okay. have 
invested in, in black owned businesses, et cetera. The death of Mr. George Floyd, if it is not known through social media and exacerbated by traditional media, the effect, if people were not going onto the streets, if violence as a result of anger towards George Floyd's death did not happen, um, if uh, there were not enough protests in the country, and if there were not enough international pressure and curiosity, at least, about where America is going, whether there will be real change as, or at least some real change, as has been demonstrated today. In other words, um, is it real change that we're talking about? Or is it change because of other factors and pressures that, that we are seeing today? Professor Aziz. Well, there's a famous quote by Frederick Douglass that says, power seeds nothing without a demand. Mm. And uh, as an attorney, as a civil rights advocate, that is kind of the first lesson that you learn is that uh, power will not seed power. Uh, and that's in any country and any society and regardless who is in power. And so social media has completely transformed and made accountable, uh, or at least made it where people in power, in this case, police officers and their supervisors and the mayors and the governors couldn't lie anymore. And, there, and that has historically been the fact because it, the case is that those in power will just lie and say, no, no, it's not what you think, or it's not serious, or they will hide information and in fact one consequence that's been quite devastating to again primarily african-american males is uh, these cases as part of the innocence project initiatives where we're discovering there are hundreds if not thousands of black men in jail who are otherwise innocent and oftentimes it's not simply because there was no dna evidence but it was that prosecutors and investigators uh, hid information or kept information from the defense counsel or relied on dubious witnesses or juries were biased. Mm -hmm. So again, going back to my point that this is a cultural and political problem, that that's the root cause of it. And one point that's important, especially for those who don't live in the U.S. to know, is that America, unfortunately, is a highly segregated society along race and class. And because uh, income and wealth continues to be disproportionately concentrated among uh, white Americans, among some other groups, but disproportionately less, African Americans have less wealth as a group and lower income as a group mm -hmm. in this country that's much, uh, at, at a much higher proportion than even the representation of the population. And so because of class and race intersections, you have communities that are segregated along race and so they're not in white people do not for the most part live with black people go to school with them uh in socialize with them obviously there's exceptions but if you look at a nationwide level we have a real problem with segregation along race and class and so that then prevents the resolution of these cultural problems where when people get to know each other mm -hmm. and when they interact with each other it's not as easy to manipulate them with negative stereotypes and they're going to be much more critical when the government or the media or the police uh, perpetuate uh, racist narratives and they're going to question that with critical thinking skills okay. so again we do need legal reforms but the law is simply a mirror of society right. so society also we need to focus on those uh, cultural and social problems Professor Aziz described vividly and in detail the ecosystem in which racial uh, prejudice against African Americans uh, flourished uh, over the decades. Uh, Ms. Curtis, tell me more about the earlier question I asked. Uh, what ifs, uh, those what ifs, do you think this is a real change or it's a change only on the surface addressing one incident that had tremendous impact in the country? But I would say, even going back to civil rights demonstrations in the 60s and before, before there was legislation, you did have to have protest. Uh, people always have to force that issue for there to be change. And then there has to be vigilance. 
Uh, even now you see the Justice Department investigating police departments in cities like Louisville to look at the systemic changes mm. uh, that need to be done. It is a matter of systems. You saw not just with George Floyd, but with our year of COVID, mm. how even our healthcare system, there are so many disparities because of race. So it goes through education, uh, housing, all of these systems. And, um, you know, this is, as you say, international. We saw demonstrations around the world. And in each case, many of the minorities in those countries brought up instances in their own countries that they could relate to. Mm. Um, but you did see that an African-American woman was just confirmed, Kristen Clark, to be the first black woman to head the civil rights right. division of mm. our Department of Justice. And uh, she has a history of civil rights uh, act activism. But even then you see she was confirmed on a very close margin because it is still sometimes controversial to be someone who works for civil rights. Mm. So there is change, but people cannot relax because there always has to be vigilance to make sure people live up to it. And it's right. not just this happened, we did it, let's move on to the next thing. Politically, Mr. Andrews, we saw the George Floyd incident happen, that tragedy, and the wake-up call to the whole nation in your country happened at a time closer to the presidential election. We understand that the president came into the office with promises to the African-American communities. Whether, once again, this is going to be sustainable, because we see one White House, one administration, came at a time when uh, the presidential election was going on. Friction is, is, is required for progress. And the only way any of the gains that we've made, um, whether it's um, gains in terms of public opinion that I alluded to earlier, or gains from a legislative standpoint, or gains in terms of commitments that have been made in the private sector, the only way those things are going to manifest and actually become something positive for the communities that they're focused on, um, on, on supporting is through continued advocacy, through continued friction, through uh, folks from the, the from from the black community, but also uh, from the from the majority population in the United States, and uh, I think it can happen and will continue to happen because we now have this significant advocacy in infrastructure that, again, thanks to some of these private commitments that have been made, um, is now fairly well funded. So there's um, f there's longitudinal funds of available for. And, and sustainability for some of these civil rights and social justice organizations mm -hmm. that just didn't exist in the past. And so, again, friction is required for progress. That's the American system. That's the American way. You know, this week uh, is also the okay. 100th year anniversary of, of the Tulsa race massacre. Um, there's video of that from 1921, but even with the video and with the eyewitness stories, um, folks in Oklahoma and, and around the country denied that it happened for decades. And it's only been in the past you know, 20, 30 years that it's actually been bec become more well known and actually um, acknowledged by the, by the state government there. And so it takes time, but, um, but the progress is happening. Professor Aziz, how do you see this individual incident about George Floyd vis-a-vis uh, -vis the overall picture of uh, tremendous uh, social changes, class changes, political changes of different groups uh, inside the country? Well, the United States is in a major transformation. It's in the process of an unprecedented, unprecedented demographic change, which will be that there will not be a majority race come 2045. And so those who identify as white, which is you know, race is a social construction. So it's whatever the society decides is white or black or uh, et cetera, any other race, but they will not be the majority. And so if this continues to be a majoritarian political system, that means that there will be no one group that will have all the privileges that come with the majority uh, in terms of power and wealth. And we're seeing this transformation in terms of the demographic shifts in, in people who are not white starting to become socially mobile, have college degrees, high graduate degrees, become CEOs of companies, start companies, become wealthier. I mean, you're seeing this social mobility and they are realizing that 
their groups continue to be stereotyped negatively, and that's impeding their ability to earn or to experience full citizenship rights or full equality. And they're pushing for more representation uh, in, in, as anchors and editors of newspapers, more representation in C-suites and corporate uh, and companies, more representation among partners at law firms, and so on and so forth. So this big push for diversity is coming from this larger and larger group of non-whites who are now in their 20s and their 30s and even reaching their 40s, and it's going to continue to shift. And as they become more powerful and influential, they no longer will accept a status quo that subordinates their communities and that mm. stereotypes their communities and that uh, hurts their communities economically, uh, for example. So I think that George Floyd's death was in some ways um, the straw that broke the camel's back, although it's, it's been many straws, unfortunately, because we saw the death of Freddie Gray, we saw the death of uh, Tamara Rice. I mean, there's been so many black men mm. and black boys, young, young boy or, or young men that are teenagers, but minors who have been killed by police officers and so George Floyd was one, you know, towards the culmination of that. And because the video was so atrocious or the what he did in terms of eight minutes of literally his knee on his neck killing him, um, is it, it, it became very obvious to, to everyone in America, even some of the most conservative people, that there was a very serious racial problem that off, honestly reminded us of the horrific images we saw in the 1960s mm -hmm. when blacks had African-American protesters had, had dogs unleashed on them and water hoses and all of the um, the very blatantly anti-black racist actions that were happening you know, during the civil rights movement. So there was some question of have, how have we come have we have we come far enough or have we made any any progress. Uh, so this is just the beginning of more change and, and just finally the backlash against that is this rise of white nativism. And so the Trump era and the Trump administration really exposed the ugly underbelly of racism in America because he was so openly xenophobic, mm -hmm. Islamophobic, anti-black, anti-Semitic that, or his, and the people, his base held those views and he supported his base, the Charlottesville a race uh, protest, which turned into a race riot provoked by a white right-wing extremist. And mm. the president says, well, there were bad people on both sides. That was that was clearly disingenuous and, and false. So uh, America is going through a transition. And I talk about this in my forthcoming book, The Racial Muslim with Racism Quashes Religious Freedom, about how this demographic shift is creating right. uh, all sorts of isms. And now you're getting the youth that are saying no, we're, we're, and, and these youth include white people that are saying, no, this isn't the country we want to live in. Mm. Even though Trump lost the last election, though he's saying he won, he did get more votes than the first time. And it just shows that while some are excited about the progress and the changes in this country and the possibilities, there are others who feel that any kind of progress, it's a zero sum game. Mm. And what some folks of color are achieving is somehow taking away. So you see, but this is happens throughout history. With progress, there is always pushback. And so basically you see a lot of laws being put forth in the states to restrict voting, to uh, basically dilute the voting power of people of color because they came out so much in the last election and turned a state like Georgia, they elected a an African-American senator and a Jewish-American senator. Uh, and so, as I said, this is not, I don't think it, it's a sense of our leaders going back one or the other. I think it's the American people because they are the ones in the streets. They are the ones making the decisions and they're, it's the future. And so uh, I do think that, yes, there is pushback to this progress and to the demographic change. Mm -hmm. How will America meet it? Uh, will it be on the side of justice? And I think that's something you saw what happened on January 6th, uh, and you see now what's going on with the demonstrations because of George Floyd. Uh, and something that Brandon said earlier, a lot of this is happening in states and on the local level. Uh, in Minnesota, one reason that Derek Chauvin was prosecuted is you had an African-American 
Attorney General Keith Ellison, who strongly went after this justice. So it, it, people have to realize it matters who you elect to be Attorney General. Mm -hmm. All of these ballots, all of these elected officials, it matters. It's not just the president. And uh, it ultimately is up to the people. And, and that's what many people found so exciting in the last year. And that's what others found a little bit frightening because uh, people are going to raise their voices in the cause of justice. Right. Mr. Andrews, your final thoughts, too. I think as we think about this politically, um, whether it is um, Joe Biden in the White House or whether it is Kevin McCarthy and other and other Republicans, um, there is a desire to see more accountability here in the system um, across the political across the political spectrum. Yeah. Um, the question is, will uh, members of Congress, uh, will state and local elected officials um, take the steps necessary to provide the protections that that that, that you mentioned um, are are laid out in the in the Constitution? Um, beyond that, I think um, a lot of these issues are exacerbated by class, they're exacerbated by socioeconomic factors, as, as Professor Aziz alluded to. And so, for example, Maxine Waters uh, in, in the House of Representatives has a, a bill that's moving forward to get first-time homebuyers and, and homebuyers of color uh, some kind of assistance on down mm -hmm. payments because having some kind of real estate, having some kind of home is a key part to being economically stable. And you look at some of these um, flashpoints, some of these murders that we've seen, whether it's Eric Garner, whether it is George Floyd, um, selling loose cigarettes, selling CDs, using a fake $20 bill, a lot of these issues are exacerbated by the fact that people aren't in a good economic position. And so I think anything that we can do, again, whether it's from the private sector with some of these commitments that have been made or from the public sector legislation um, to support and, and provide the infrastructure, Biden's infrastructure bill will provide a lot of jobs and opportunities for folks. Anything that we can do there is going to lessen the blow of some of the um, inequity that may still be there in the justice system. Um, progress is happening. It's taking longer than we want, but there are things we can do to certainly make it better as we look at one year since the death of George Floyd. Right. Um, we talk a lot, ladies and gentlemen, but there are a lot of other issues we did not even have the time to touch on when it comes to racial justice. Uh, I am more closely linked to the Asian American uh, community inside your country and there has been tremendous pre prejudice against them in recent months regarding related to COVID-19 and uh, there are tremendous tasks certainly in front of every one of us. I want to thank all of you uh, for providing real insights and professional analysis uh, for this discussion. Really appreciate it. Mary C. Curtis, Sarah Aziz and Brendan Andrews. Thank you so much. And this is World Inside, I'm Tian Wei. Coming up, a COVID vaccine lifeline amid the pandemic, which China pledged to deliver doses of the WHO-approved Sinopharm vaccine to COVAX and the world's most vulnerable. But why are vaccines so geopolitically charged? An international studies professor with answers. Up now. China has been working rather hard in making a vaccine product available both domestically and internationally. Welcome back. This is World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. The global fight against the pandemic has made little progress with the scarce delivery of COVID vaccines to vulnerable nations as rich countries have stockpiled doses. Earlier, the World Health Organization granted emergency approval for China's Sinopharm vaccine, the first from a non-Western country to gain the WHO's approval. China has also announced it will provide 10 million vaccine doses to COVAX for emergency use in developing countries, becoming the biggest economy to back the COVAX initiative to date. So could Chinese vaccines help turn the tide against the pandemic? Could geopolitics get in the way of matters of life and death? Earlier, I spoke to Jia Daojun, a professor at the School of International Studies with Peking University. He's been doing research about vaccines and politics behind vaccines for some time. Let's hear his insights. 
I'm joined by Professor Jia Daojun from the School of International Studies at Peking University. He's been devoting a lot of his energy recently on vaccine-related issues research. Uh, Professor Jia, good to see you again. Good seeing you, and good evening. Good evening to you. Now, what do you make of, finally, some of China's vaccines made onto the emergency use list of WHO's vaccine for COVID-19? It's um, a development that's worth uh, celebrating um, for possibly three uh, main reasons. Mm -hmm. One is that uh, the WHO has really exercised uh, its authority in approving a quality vaccine, as you have uh, you know, certainly observed along the way. There were numerous questioning about the safety, efficacy, of the Chinese made vaccines and there were accusations of China using vaccines for diplomatic purpose. So the WHO was in a lot of, under a lot of stress, but it exercised its proper judgment. And secondly, for the uh, uh, Chinese uh, product itself, you know, it can take pride in the fact that this is the first vaccine that's developed uh, in the developing country that has received uh, emergency use authorization by the WHO. Mm -hmm. And it's a milestone um, achievement. Now, most importantly, that's a third one, that is uh, the Chinese vaccine, because uh, partly because of what's accused of diplomatic, uh, uh, political diplomacy, you know, China has been working rather hard in making its vaccine products available both domestically and internationally. Mm. If you look at the number of doses uh, injected, about half um, were in China, about half uh, in abroad. So yes. the rest of the world, especially in the poor countries, desperately needs vaccines. So we have these available and with good authorization. Mm. Now, this is uh, quite unprecedented, but at the same time, before this, China's vaccines have already won, you know, bilateral approval uh, in 40 countries and regions already. Uh, what does that mean to uh, WHO, in a way, as reference? Well, um, the WHO actually is more than just a bureaucracy. It uh, formulates a, uh, I mean, um, it appoints a panel that's called, uh, uh, the acronym is SAGE, yeah. which is Strategic Advisory Group of um, Experts in Immunology. So in other words, these are individuals who normally work in hospitals, in university research labs, in teaching jobs. These are really professionals around the world mm. who have their personal career and reputation on the line. So they are there making their independent judgment. They make the recommendation for the WHO uh, headquarters to adopt. Yes. So this, we're really talking about expertise, but in terms of, I don't think the SAGE group counts, you know, the number of governments that approve any vaccine or the it worries about vaccine um, approvals at, at all. Basically, these are, uh, professionals, right. the, uh, the research people who have to be responsible to science. Mm. Professor Jia, the other thing is about the types of vaccines that China produces are uh, different if you look at the, the short list of emergency use by WHO, very different in types uh, uh, compared to the other vaccines. So how do you see the fact that it seems that all kinds of vaccines now are making themselves onto the list? there are at least 14, one, four, proven uh, pathways to develop a vaccine from scratch. Now, the methodology that's being used by the two Chinese vaccines in the UL list uh, is proven. It has been in the market for some 30 to 40 years. Uh, it's not the vaccine that, you know, use uh, what's called uh, more advanced or mm -hmm. latest development in uh, uh, some of the Western countries. But I don't really know if you, uh, 
how to assess this, uh, whatever technology, whatever you know, technological pathway you take, at the end of the day, it has to be proven safe and effective. Right. And to assess the effectiveness or possible side effects, we are really talking about uh, years after years of tracking after the injection. Mm -hmm. So the conclusion about you know which methodology really works um, is too early. Uh, let me ask you, you know, we are not, the world is not in a vacuum. There are so many different factors that are impacting on the future of vaccines, uh, including on the COVAX platform. Now, how much geopolitics is play its role? Uh, at this moment, how much can we afford geopolitics to play its role? In terms of well, life and death, how are we going to make our choice, politics or life? Yeah, at this point of time, highly political, partly because of the uncertainties of new variants and then the challenge between opening your uh, borders and closing the borders or, you know, choosing that narrow window. Everybody wants to return to normal as fast as possible. What's not being justifiable is that some of the uh, developed countries are literally hoarding vaccines. And the vaccines have a lifespan. Some of the new products actually will have to be discarded or destroyed after mm -hmm. a couple of months of storage. And then you have residents in many of the developing, uh, developed countries that refuse to take the vaccines. So an obvious solution in terms of humanity is to ship these available through COVAX or uh, bilaterally, but that's not being done. Mm. Or in the case of, uh, you know, some situations, you know, some governments say, well, I can sh ship to you certain million doses, but this is really a loan to you. At some point of time, you have to return it to me. Yeah. And this is a very typical my country first approach. Um, but you asked a really good question. But on the other hand, I would think the dire situation is that um, the uh, developing countries have to just find ways to get into partnerships and speed up probably ma manufacturing of vaccines mm -hmm. outside uh, certain prime locations. But of course, that needs to be done on the basis of safety first and mm. the technical expertise first. Now, of course, India used to play a big role in terms of international production of vaccines. Now, the country itself will face certain challenge and therefore decided not to export vaccines anymore that they produced. So, uh, Professor Jia, how big a, you know, a vacuum or a, a hole we are likely to see, uh, do you see others will be able to play a proactive role in terms of filling that hole? Uh, it's a big yes and no. Now, a, a word about the Indian situation first. India is very strong in manufacturing the vaccine, as just pointed out. But um, it has to be living at the mercy of, you know, opening the supply chain, keeping the supply chain open in terms of the raw materials, in terms of the ingredients, and especially the key ingredients that develop in labs in Europe and North America. Mm. Otherwise, the factories in India are going to run, be running on the empty. And secondly, India uh, has its own version of vaccines, and that production can be ramped up and then to address the dire situation in that country, I would think uh, a good ex to have some confidence in the vaccines that produce later on in mm -hmm. India, or you know, is that we really help India with the ingredients so that they can uh, move forward and keep, get the factories running in full capacity right. again and vaccinate Indian. But then for other countries, you, you pay the attention, you know, here in China, mm. over there in South Korea, in um, Mexico and uh, Vietnam, Brazil and whatnot, Malaysia and Singapore. We have a lot of facilities that can manufacture as well. Here, the issue is uh, intellectual property rights. Mm. The issue is technology transfer. And then you also have the issue of, goes, this goes back to 
uh, those companies that have been recommended by the WHO uh, to supply the world, they should really rethink the good old strategy of maximizing the profits. If they can come down with that demand for maximizing, maximizing shareholder profits, they can reduce uh, the premium they charge on the uh, manufacturers, mm -hmm. they can simplify the procedures, then we can expand production fairly fast. Yeah. Professor Zhao Daozhong from Peking University, who had been devoting his energy recently on the research of geopolitics related to vaccines. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. That's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more Search World Insights, or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. And bye for now.